Good evening and welcome to Beyond the Mask, a trust building and listening tour. This is the first of five virtual community engagement events hosted by Colorado Springs School District 11. My name is Patty Pierce, and over the past 20 some years, I've held various roles in the district, but am now retired. I'm thrilled and honored to be the moderator for the panel discussion this evening. Tonight's Beyond the Mask topic is moving forward. Where have we been? Where are we going? Moving the district forward with plans for equity, academics, and facilities. We have a panel of district leaders and experts joining us tonight who will be addressing the questions. Let's start our evening with introductions of tonight's panelists. Panelists, when I call your name, please wave your hand so that everyone can put a face and a name together. Are we ready? Mr. Jim Mason, Board of Education Secretary. Mr. Glenn Gustafson, Deputy Superintendent, Chief Financial Officer. Mr. David Engstrom, Deputy Superintendent, Achievement, Learning, and Leadership. Ms. Phoebe Bailey, Assistant Superintendent, Personnel Support Services. Mr. John McCarran, Assistant Superintendent, Chief Information Officer. Dr. David Kalicki, Executive Director, Educational Data and Student Support Services. Ms. Sherry Kolbach, Executive Director, School Leadership. Mr. Corey Notstein, Executive Director, Student Success and Wellness. Ms. Alexis Knox Miller, Equity Director. And to round us off, Dr. Thomas, Superintendent, District 11. Please take it, Dr. Thomas. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Pierce. It's great to see you again. Uh, she is a long-standing leader in our community, and uh, thank you so much again for agreeing to moderate the conversation this evening. And I just want to make sure that we introduce Mr. Daniel Hoff, who was one of our EDSLs. Unless I missed it, I see his picture. Oh. Is okay. he here? Oh, there he is. Yep, there he Sorry, is. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> no worries. No worries. We have a lot of grace in in uh, web in WebEx worlds. Okay. So, um, so again, uh, thank you, community, for dialing into this conversation. Um, this is something that we have been anticipating for quite some time, and given uh, the challenges that we have all been leading through since last spring, uh, we really felt it was very important for us to not lose our connection with our community. As you all know, when I interviewed here for the superintendent job three years ago, there were three uh, kind of dominant themes that um, I really spoke through during my conversations with the community. One was strong community and family engagement. Another was transparency. And the third was around equity. We'll be addressing several of those topics uh, throughout this evening, but the community engagement piece is something that's very near and dear to my heart. You all saw last year when we engaged our community heavily with our new strategic plan, almost 2,000 of our community members, both in district and outside of district, touched that uh, plan and we have a robust uh, guide for the future. And it's because of our community that it allowed that to come forward. Moving uh, ahead and enacting that plan is gonna take some significant lifts on our part and will take a lot of work of our community as well. We have some key work that's still happening in our district. I know that COVID has really pushed pause on a lot of things uh, throughout our community. And I know it has created a lot of uh, anxiety within our community and, and within our district. And I really want our, our uh, community to understand that in spite of the reality that we are all dealing with with COVID, we are still a viable, strong District 11 and really have our eyes set on what does District 11 look like once COVID uh, it has a cure on, on the uh, market and folks are more comfortable and open to being fully engaged uh, within our district. 
And so tonight, that's really the purpose, is to re-engage with our community, re-engage with our D11 staff. This is one big family, and, this, and it's very important for us to make sure that we stay on the same page as we move through what we anticipate to be some real challenging weeks ahead um, as our numbers continue to rise, but at the same time, still have a strong positive uh, vision for the future here of D11. So thank you for tuning in, everyone who, who's watching, and we'll do our best to try to address the questions that uh, came in ahead of time, um, as well as any opportunity, any opportunity we might have to address some this evening. So with that, I will turn it back over to you, Ms. Pierce. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Before we begin our question and answer session tonight with our panelists, please know that over 20 questions have already been submitted for the event using the public form link on the D11 website. We will begin with those questions. And if time permits, we can start to address any of the questions submitted in the Facebook comment section. We do have a moderator here in the room who's watching for live questions as they're posted. I just want to remind everyone, this is a community conversation. And we ask above all things that to please be respectful with each other's comments. We also encourage you to be solution oriented. And if you have a thought on how to positively move forward, please feel free to submit your ideas right here on Facebook. Okay, panelists, are we ready? Let's begin with the questions that have been submitted. Here's the first one. School administrators reflecting the student population in District 11, submitted by a community member. Dr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Pierce. Yeah, I think the uh, conversation that is really around this question is how will the D11 uh, staff, not just administration, but probably staff in general, reflect who we serve. We are the most diverse district in Colorado Springs. And I think that's something for us to be proud about. That's a significant strength of who we are as a district. And I think it's a very important question that this individual is bringing forward. Um, to ensure that we do have representation of our community that our kids can see every single day. They need to understand that in this case, um, building leaders or school administrators, you know, um, they reflect who we serve. That's absolutely critical to the work that we're doing with regards to our focus on equity. Um, you'll hear uh, probably conversations about equity uh, throughout a variety of questions and this one in particular really is focusing on our human resources and personnel services. And as we get ready to conduct a comprehensive district-wide equity audit, that is one area that our external consultant, who is the American Institute for Research, AIR, will be undertaking to really analyze how, what are our hiring practices? What are the requirements? Are there barriers that are put into place that we may or may not be aware of that is contributing to the lack of diversity with uh, administrators and other staff positions in our district to truly reflect um, the student population and the community's population. So I uh, can tell that individual in the community and the community, be looking forward to those conversations as we open up the equity audit within our district, because you will have a significant role to play as we shape solutions around some of those HR and personal strategies. Does anyone else want to answer that question or can we move on? Oh, we got a couple. Go ahead. Oh. And I just want to add that. Um, you know, in our um, in our district, you know, with the ebb and flow of our student enrollment, you know, we um, acquire um, employees, you know, they may come in, they're recruited into our district. Um, if we lose enrollment, then we lose those employees because they have not established their longevity. So in some instances, when we um, uh, recruit and hire employees that look like our students. Um, 
in some instances they are unable to stay. So that is also why um, we're trying to look within our district and tap individuals on the shoulders that look like our students and try to, you know, begin to coach and mentor and promote from within. So I just wanted to add that. And that is something that, you know, Dr. Thomas is very, very focused on in our district to grow our grow our own um you know aspiring leaders within the district that we pull the population that we serve thank you Phoebe. patty could i add one more thing yes. too, please? please david um you know and, and good evening everyone and, and it's really a pleasure to be here tonight in this in this community forum but i think i need to add one more layer to that and that is um uh, since we have started on this equity journey, since Dr. Thomas has joined us here in District 11, um, there have been many people that in district have raised their hand and said, you know what, connecting with all of our students and developing relationships with all of our students begins with me. And, and many people have said, I know it has to start with me. And we can't wait as a district until the adults of color join us and that we put it on their shoulders to lead us to the next steps we need to be taking on an equity journey. And so I'm pleased of how many people in our district have said, and speaking as a white male, of that we can't wait for that. We have to own this and we have to establish relationships with our students. We have to know them. We have to see them, we have to understand them, we have to know their strengths, and that it needs to be everyone in the organization. Thank you. Alexis, did you want to say something? Yes, just to add to what everybody has been saying, um, and just a layer of what's happening nationwide. We need more teachers of color, right? So we have a pipeline that gets us more principals of color. Um, and it's the chicken or the egg theory, which one came first, it doesn't matter. But as we begin to hire more diversely, we will see a pipeline of more leadership, more teachers of color. And we know that when we have more teachers of color, we have better outcomes for all of our students. Also, I wanna say that I know that HR has already been looking at their policies, even are in their guidances even prior to the equity audit starting. Um, Ms. Ewing has called me into meetings um, and into interview panels to see if there's anything that we need to be doing and using a different lens when we're hiring and asking about practices. So the conversation has already started and I think that that's an amazing thing for our district. Thank you, Alexis. I'm, oh, Director Mason. Do we have two or three more minutes? because this is a very important topic. Let me add just, just a, a different perspective. It's actually more complex than just bringing on a diverse staff, especially when we talk about staff of color. First of all, a lot of our rules will have to be modified. As, a point, as pointed out by Assistant uh, Superintendent Bailey, when your process is first, last in, first out, regardless of qualifications and performance, you've got a problem. You will never build the team you want unless you modify those rules. We've got to be prepared to do that. In community, you have to help us do this. And there's some history behind this. Remember, we have inherited a very difficult situation. I'm a, I'm a student of, integ of integration and segregation. Born and raised, went to school in Conway, Arkansas. I went to segregated schools. I was one of the first kids that integrated Conway Junior High School back in the late 60s. And sometimes we forget this, this is a fact. When we integrated students, we did not integrate staff. If you review the history books, black teachers, Hispanic teachers were not welcome in the white schools. Okay, what was the second and third order effect of that decision? A lot of professionals of color who would have gone into teaching did not because it was not an avenue, a career avenue. It was denied to them. And over the years, many 
very qualified people of color chose not to go into teaching. They went into other career fields. And now here we are today trying to bring those folks in and look at the environment we're trying to bring them into. We bring them into a system where you're the first, you're the last one in, you're the first out, despite your qualifications or your performance. We bring them into an environment where the salary and the compensation is probably not as competitive as many of your industries. Therefore, you're putting people of color that are very well qualified in a no-win situation. I want to teach, but when the schools and the districts have to downsize because of my tenure, lack of tenure, I'm the first one out. So I got to go look for a job again. The compensation is not very competitive. I've got the qualifications. Guess who else wants me? Your industry wants you as well. I'm in industry. I'm going to tell you something right now. I'm always looking to hire a person of color with the qualifications, and I can outpay you. <laughs> okay, who's going to win that? We have to got. We have to change our approach if we're serious about bringing more high, quali highly qualified staff members of color. Our current paradigm and our current system does not promote that objective. Clear cut, it does not promote that objective and we've got to do something about it or we're just talking. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Director Mason. We appreciate that. I'm going to go on to question number two. How does the district plan to ensure that students are meeting standards without conducting standardized tests? It seems many students may be falling behind. This was submitted by a parent. David? Yeah, thank you. Um, so Dave Colicky, Executive Director of Education Insights, formerly EDSS, or Education Data and Support Services. So we, over, we oversee the assessment cycle, schedule, and collection of data. Um, so this is a good question. I think there's two questions embedded. So the first question is, is more broad. The uh, status of standardized testing in the state as required by federal every child um, every student succeeds act so cms testing um psat testing and sat testing that's conducted by the by the state so clearly that was suspended um suspended last spring for uh, due to covid and we don't have clear direction yet for this spring um so we are waiting for that based on federal and state state guidance so we knew coming into this year that that would be the case and that there would be um, a lot of variability and, and many variables and many unknowns in coming into this. And so what we decided to do uh, as executive leadership in partnership with my team is to really take control of our own outputs and outcomes and ways of measuring because we can't we can't depend on on uh, spotty information. So we wanted to do that. And we also secondly wanted to know and try to start, start to look at what types of learning losses are we looking at from the fourth quarter of last year to the end of first quarter and first first semester of this year. So what we what we've done is uh, utilize a tool called the Universal Screener. It's through our normal testing procedure, but if you if you if you know about how how we utilize standardized tests within the district, we use we often or in the past we've utilized an aligned district benchmark. Which means looking at how course or how um, students and instruction are aligned across the district based on pacing guides that have been developed within the district. Clearly, coming out of um, coming out of the variability of fourth quarter, um, that alignment certainly suffered, and we did we have seen that. And so, an aligned district benchmark was not the best tool. So, a universal screener allowed allows us to take a baseline snapshot of students where they're at at the beginning of the year, again in the middle of the year, and again at the end of the year. And it's all aligned to standards, grade level standards, state aligned grade level standards. So it's aligned to CMAS and SAT, and it, and it gives us that same trajectory. So, we're in, so in a very real sense, we're using the, the uh, universal screener as a proxy for um, State, state testing that may or may not happen this spring. 
So we have been we've set up strategically to have a tool in place that's aligned with state standards um, that gives us a clear picture of where students are starting. And most importantly, and this is really the story of D11 is a story of growth. Most importantly, it has a growth metric that's aligned with the state calculation of growth that we can utilize to say, how are our interventions, our treatments, our, our initiatives and efforts playing out related to student achievement by measuring growth over time? And so we have, in one sense, yes, we have, um, there are no state level standardized tests and to our knowledge, there's a high chance that we won't be in the spring. We don't know that yet, waiting for guidance. But we have a very nice parallel uh, proxy tool that we're using within our within our system. And if I may speak to the gaps that we do see, uh, we have seen, um, and this was a this was a big topic of conversation uh, a couple of board work sessions ago, was that within ELA we certainly have seen seen drops in performance. We had. We have had a learning loss over from fourth quarter till first quarter of this year. It was smaller in ELA. It was quite pronounced in, in math. We had, we had more than probably 75% on average of students performing below grade level in math across grades. Now, to put it in context, the entire nation is looking at these types of numbers across systems. So, so there is, it's a common, it's a common uh, question and a common concern. And certainly one we are taking very seriously. So ELA just by nature is, is a more iterative, uh, you kind of take the basic skills and you utilize them in just normal situations through life. Math, it's a little bit different. Those are skills that you develop. And if you don't keep using them and keep developing them, then they do get, they do get lost and you see some learning loss. So those gaps are to be expected. So what we're really doing is working with uh, building leaders both building administrators and um, teacher leaders to really take that data and create um, actionable plans that are short cycle in nature. And by short cycle, I mean, instead of setting up a goal for a year, this time next year, we'll have lots of students proficient in math. That's a worthy endeavor, but we need to, we need to cut those goals in half to really look at what, what avenues, what strategies are required to get students to that next checkpoint, which is the um, middle of year test, which we've actually now opened up. Uh, we have probably maybe more than, a, um, we have many administrations, I think more than 100 administrations so far, it opened up this week. So teachers and, and building administrators are taking it very seriously. It'll stay open through December, and then we'll have an extended window um, even after January for our middle and high schools. So we do have a standardized metric. It's not the state metric, but it is aligned to the state metric that we're using to measure growth. Great. Thank you very much. David Engstrom, do you want to add something? Yeah, I, I sure do. Patty, thank you. Um, we have a, I, I have a saying here in District 11, you can, you can throw a rock in central administration, and you're going to hit somebody named David. And so uh, both David Colligy and I are going to answer, we're going to answer this question, but, um, and, and I'll be, I'll be very brief. David went, went straight to kind of the specifics of the question about accountability of reaching standards. No matter what our learning platform is in District 11, if it's in person, if it's remote, or if it's a hybrid of both, and bless our teachers that are teaching in, in a hybrid environment, our lessons are to be standard aligned and that they're formative check-ins continuing no matter what type of instructional strategy or platform we are using to ensure that the students are, are achieving and gaining understanding. And, and so it starts there. It starts with standards aligned um, uh, lessons, uh, engaging instructional strategies, no matter the platform that we're using. So that the outcome is that the students are learning when they are assessed, whether it's a state standard or whether it's a District 11 accountability um, uh, assessment. Thank you, David, I appreciate that. I'm going to go on to, to number three, which is not really a question, but more of a statement. Thank you all for your hard work during this time. I think this year is going very well under very difficult circumstances. And that was um, submitted by a parent and PTA member at Holmes in Coronado. 
Dr. Thomas, would you like to take that? Uh, sure. First, I'll just say thank you to the community. Uh, we, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if we didn't have the support of our community. And I just want to acknowledge that uh, these are very challenging times. And our staff at D11 are dedicated to ensuring uh, overall health, wellness, and safety, uh, as well as the high quality instruction that we can provide given the confines that COVID is creating to be sometimes in person and sometimes at a moment's notice having to go into a remote platform and for those families who are choosing to be in a remote platform as well. So thank you so much uh, uh, for your patience with us during these times. Um, and just on behalf of all of our staff, we will continue to offer our full commitment to supporting our students, staff, and community. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. And I'm gonna stay with you for the next question as well. Why have the needs of parents slash students been prioritized above the needs of your staff submitted by a staff member? Um, well, I think I see it a little differently than maybe uh, this staff person is viewing it. Um, I want to just share right off the bat um, to all the staff in District 11 that I deeply care about the safety and, and wellness of, of our staff. Okay. This is the D11 family, and I don't use that metaphor lightly. We spend a lot of time together outside of our primary family units, and this becomes our, our home away from home. And our overall well-being is one of my greatest cares. Uh, when, when COVID came upon us last spring, um, my biggest fear is, you know, having uh, a student or a staff member or, you know, parent uh, become impacted. And, you know, I just can't even begin to explain what that level of anxiety and fear does to somebody when you have to, you know, weather that for months upon, upon months. Um, but I don't prioritize um, student needs um, over staff needs. I think equally, everyone's needs have to be considered. And how we consider needs might look a little different based upon who we're talking about. The needs of our staff are different than needs of our students and needs of our students are different than needs of our parents. So, you know, I think there's some distinction there and perhaps that's where it might be coming. I'm not too sure, but I can assure the staff and our community that I will never make decisions hastily that would jeopardize the safety of our staff or anyone in our district for that matter. So that would be my response to that staff member. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Does anybody else wanna to touch that? May I move on to the next question? Okay. I'm gonna direct this one to the executive directors of school leadership. There is seemingly no accountability for building leaders around systemic inequities discipline, grading, rigor expectations. And this was submitted by a staff member. I'm gonna let y'all talk to that and then Dr. Thomas. Thank you. Sherry, you wanna go? Sure, thanks Patty. I appreciate you um, sending this one my way. And certainly this is something that we as executive directors of school leadership, um, think about is is at the front of our minds on a very regular basis too because of course we want to provide um, equitable opportunities and access to our students across the district regardless of the school that they attend that being said uh, the role of the executive director of school leadership is really to find a balance with our school principals and our school leadership teams across over 50 school sites um, that range all the way from uh, Jenkins on the far northeast side of town to Midland on the far southwest side of town. We really work hard to ensure that we are paying attention to site-based needs, uh, site-based ownership, what projects, what uh, instructional strategies, what pieces are really important to the staff, the students, and the families at a particular school and the leadership at a school um, across those 50 plus sites. Obviously, we have 50 very different leaders um, who are going to approach problems and situations and opportunities in different ways. 
that all has to be balanced with data reviews where we are looking at those pieces that this uh, question calls out for us. Are we approaching student discipline? Um, are we approaching course selection for students? All sorts of different pieces in an equitable manner. And I will tell you, I, I think we have great opportunity for growth in this area. We've certainly not perfected this yet, um, but it's something that we're working toward with the help of folks like Alexis Max Miller, um, who are helping us to see some different perspectives and look at data in different ways. I would also encourage others who are really interested in this particular piece to consider joining your school's school accountability committee. One of their charges is to look at all data for a school on a very regular basis and principals welcome the opportunity to engage with these groups that include both staff and community um, on these particular pieces. Thank you, Sherry. Dan, do you have something you'd like to add? Absolutely. Um, I, I would just share with the community that we are having these discussions. We are having these actions. And uh, certainly I will go back to what uh, my colleague Sherry Callback mentioned. And that is uh, so happy to have Alexis Knox Miller involved in these conversations as well so that we can continue to push forward with an equity mindset and coaching and looking forward. Uh, it isn't an absence of that occurring. It has occurred and will continue to occur with uh, with a bigger at each one of our school sites as uh, we continue to get better, learn forward, and uh, continue with an equity mindset. Thank you, Dan. Dr. Thomas, do you want to add anything? I, I would echo what was been sh what's been shared, um, but I, I will say that. Um, you know, I, I can't emphasize this in a very respectful way. Accountability is extremely uh, important in, di in District 11 across e multiple uh, fronts, uh, whether it's the accountability to our first question of how do we have uh, proper hiring practices to uh, the accountability around um, what happens in our schools or what happens throughout our central admin departments. Um, that's not something we take lightly in District 11. And um, I, I just would iter reiterate, um, when we're looking at school practice, um, you know, it'll never be perfect. I, I will fully admit that. But I would say that the leaders and the staff and support staff all throughout our schools that I observe on a very regular basis are very dedicated um, to our students. Um, they're very dedicated to the, each other as colleagues. Um, I, again, I think there's room for improvement that we can always uh, grow. Uh, we talk all the time in District 11. We have to model being learners ourselves. Uh, we talked about in our strategic plan, the word student applies to our students sitting in our desks as well as the big people in our schools and throughout the central office. We're all students. We're all learners here in District 11. Um, so we will utilize a lot of metrics that you heard Dr. Colley talk about to have conversations um, around key areas, whether it's discipline, uh, consistent grading, um, the, the rigor, and where we see gaps, that's where we focus our energies to coach up, as we heard uh, 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 Mr. Hoff share. Um, and then we also know that not everyone will be able to perform at the levels that we expect, and people will be moved on as well. So I just wanna give everybody the, the reality, the continuum is, from just starting off to folks who are, re are retiring or moving on in their careers. And that's something that we will always continue to strive for, high accountability and expectations for, for our D11 family. Thank you very much. The, the next um, statement is a concern from a parent within the district. And here it is, students not getting temperature checked in every classroom and students not wearing masks outside. Corey, do you want to take that one? Yeah, thank you, Patty, um, and good evening, community. I know these are obviously times when we're, we're concerned and trying to find many ways to mitigate the transmission of COVID. Uh, there's lots of strategies that our, our district deploys in order to do so. Uh, and many of those things start in the homes of both the staff and our, and our families before they ever leave the door. 
and making sure that they're healthy and well before entering our schools, but also considering who they may have been in contact with uh, prior to entering our schools become very important, especially now when the transmission levels are increasing. Uh, in relation to uh, temperature checks uh, before and to directly uh, address the question, uh, a couple things uh, to that point. Uh, our local health, public health agency has not recommended that for entrance into our schools as a requirement to be done by staff members of students. We actually ask parents to do that as part of their symptom checks before sending their child to school. The other aspect of that is we've not seen our Colorado Department of Public Instruction, so CDE, um, talk to us and, and gave us guidance that that is also not a requirement. Uh, however, if a child does come to our school ill and appears ill, we do have the ability to bring them into a space, um, assess their, their well-being, and if we need to check their temperature, we absolutely will. Uh, and we do that regularly with students that come to our building either before COVID. Um, and so I, I recognize that um, that is a factor, that is a symptom that we look for. But I can also tell you that uh, a temperature is not a sure sign of COVID. Uh, we've not seen that as the number one symptom uh, for COVID. And an even a more telling symptom of uh, COVID is loss of taste or smell and a complete absence thereof, not just the diminished that we might experience during a common cold or congestion. And so that is really a symptom that becomes critical for us to observe and to have our families look for. Uh, in relation to masks, uh, one thing the district has been ahead on uh, is having our students anywhere at the age of three and above wearing masks. Uh, and that has now become a recommendation in many aspects nationally and the district started that way when we were returning students to school. I think it was a really good proactive approach that our board and superintendent supported. Uh, and all our schools have been really supportive and our families have been as well in making sure their, their students have masks. And if they don't, the schools have the ability to provide them. Uh, the question about do they need to wear them outside, I think is the, the direct question too from the, from the concerned parent. And, there's a couple of things about that. We do ask students if they're going to be in close proximity, right, more closer than six feet to each other outside. We do want them to put a mask on. Um, however, if they're out running around, there's good reason to have a child not wearing a mask, right? There, there can be extenuating circumstances when a child become overheated, have a hard time breathing if they're out running with a mask on. And it's actually safer for them as an individual to have that mask off. Uh, I think the other thing about wearing a mask is it's a good mask break for students to be outside. They're wearing masks all day. It's a time to get fresh air uh, and do that in a safe way. Uh, and I think something Dr. Thomas has spoke to as well, our transmission in our schools are extremely low. Um, we have not seen outbreaks and widespread outbreaks in our schools. Um, and we haven't linked any of them to being outside on recess uh, without masks on. Uh, we have identified where those exist and there's potential that it could be in that location, but we've not seen a direct correlation with any transmission that we've seen in our schools related to that. And I think it's a testament to what our schools put in place and the safety precautions they're already doing. It's a real testament to our families too for doing the right thing and keeping their students home when they're not feeling well. And that's a big part of why we've been so successful thus far um, and, and I know things are shifting for us because the numbers are so high, but our, our families have been a big support for helping us. So I just want to thank them for, for all the work they're doing to help our schools stay open. Thank you, Corey. And in the same vein, the next question is, why are schools still open when there's been a positive case of COVID in that building? Yeah, there, there's, there's obviously an opportunity. So we do have cases and, and people are probably familiar with our dashboard and they'll see a, a positive or active case. Um, some of our students that show up on that or staff that show up on that dashboard might already be working from home or have been home. Um, and 
they may not have been infectious during the time that they were in school. So in those cases, the timelines are such that our schools are actually not impacted by the positive case. And so that's something that doesn't show up directly on our index. And so it's, it's a little harder for the public just to naturally see that. And I understand the concern. The other aspect of that is one positive case might be isolated to a particular classroom. We do a very good job of cohorting our students. So if a group does have a positive case in it, we're able to isolate those students and the rest of the school is not impacted, right? And so we're able to keep the other parts of the school open because we've done a very good job of containing those students and those cohorts and parts of our schools that would not have interacted uh, with other parts of the school. So that's another aspect. Um, we, we obviously, when we have many students quarantined or staff quarantined as a relation to a probable case, a positive case. And many times uh, our evaluation period when we're still waiting test results, we'll have to either temporarily quarantine staff or and students or keep them out for 14 days. And that's why you're really seeing this, the large closures of our school system is because of the, the inability to staff our spaces because of large numbers of quarantines. And I think that is the reality that we're facing. Um, and we do a very good job, again, just of, of keeping our, our numbers contained. And that's why we're able to stay open when there's a positive case in the school. Thank you, Corey. The next question is from a parent. And it's, my question is, I don't understand how this back and forth learning is sufficient for kids. I think you should do one or the other for right now. Who would like to take that? I'll Dr. Thomas. Thank you. Spears, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I will say that uh, um, I think there's some truth to how this parent is feeling. Um, it, the reality is our staff are not able to become highly effective in a remote environment or an in-person environment when the uh, back and forth is continuing to occur. So. I can understand the challenge that that presents. Um, you know, our number one goal has always been to keep our schools as open as possible um, to ensure that we can invite our students and families who are choosing to do so to come into school. As we just heard um, Mr. Notstein uh, share, uh, schools uh, for the many months now have probably been the safest places in our community. Uh, when uh, community infection rates were uh, on the rise, we were still able to effectively keep our rates uh, significantly down um, within our schools. And that's a testament to the phenomenal work of the personal protective equipment, um, our cleaning standards, our protocols that schools have set forth, and all of the resources that a student or a staff member would need to be the most uh, effective and engaged are in our schools. So that's why we really strive to keep our schools open. We know that there are families who have chosen since last spring to continue in a remote fashion. And so we've been supporting our families um, in a remote learning platform, those who are consistently there. Um, so that's always available to our families. Um, and because of the demand of that and not knowing how long we'll be in this uh, uh, phase of, of having COVID around us, we are in the works of developing and planning to open next fall an online uh, digital academy that will address the, the learning needs of many of our families um, uh, come next fall. Uh, the back and forth really goes to uh, the structural challenges that we are having with staff right now. Uh, I will just echo, we don't have COVID running rampant throughout our school communities. That is not happening. And I wanna just assure the community, again, our yeah. schools are doing an amazing job keeping those learning environments safe uh, with, with uh, cleaning and equipment and protocols. But the challenge that we're finding ourselves going into now is because the community level is so high, um, our staff and our quarantining practices are no longer targeted. They're more general 
uh, quarantining practices. Um, we are finding that many of our staff and students are uh, susceptible to those quarantines more frequently than we would like to see. Yet at the same time, we still know, again, that engagement and efficacy of being in school, the social emotional learning support that can happen in our schools when you're around uh, many other adults that can support and or your peers, that becomes a, a, another element of um, great success for our students. And so it's challenging for us to go into one or the other. We are currently moving to an all remote learning platform as a district, as probably most uh, schools across the country are headed that way, for sure in our region. Um, because of the community numbers being so high, we just don't have that ability to staff our schools. We don't have enough subs uh, in, in our sub pool. All the districts are pulling from that same pool for, for subs. And so we have no choice at this point but to go into a full online uh, learning platform. Um, and, and at this point, you know, we'll see how long we'll have to be in there. But we try to offer the most consistent platform as we possibly can. And we know it can be disruptive. But again, we will always err on trying to do what's best first, and that's that physical instruction, that physical learning environment. Um, and then as needed, we'll have to augment with that remote learning platform um, for those families who are choosing physical, but because of quarantining and whatnot, we have to take extra precautions. Um, our, our hope, and I'll close with this, is that you know, as we you know, potentially have a vaccine come to the market and we move through, I, I think this gather, natural gathering time of the season with many folks, and we're gonna see spikes in our numbers, uh, most likely over the next several weeks, if not months, um, we, we hope to get on the backside of that and then finally have some longer term solutions on the table that will keep a more consistent platform um, moving forward. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. And I'm gonna go right back to you for this next one along with David Engstrom. I wish that students who wanted to stay remote for the entire year had been assigned a specific teacher at the start of the school year. This was obviously from a parent. Can you address that thought? Yeah, you know, uh, all of our uh, school communities uh, are very different. Um, and when I say different, meaning um, by sheer size and by uh, enrollment of a school, that determines how many staff are going to be in a school. So our larger schools have greater flexibility when it comes to uh, that uh, parent's question or concern to be able to isolate an individual teacher that could take a cohort of students permanently all throughout the year, while some of our smaller campuses with fewer staff really don't have that flexibility. Perhaps there's only two teachers at a grade level and you've got on average 25 kids in, in, in a grade and one teacher goes and maybe only five students want to be online. Well, now you've got, you know, 45 students to that one teacher who's physically, you know, present in, in the classroom. So that's where it becomes very challenging. So we couldn't do a perfect one-to-one -one match, but that is something that we're striving to do as we develop our online academy that we will plan to open for next fall, where we will be able to bring cadres of teachers based upon projections of enrollment. Because again, what we also were facing um, this year is as we went into this school year, um, our schools were staffed on numbers that were projected from last spring. And when families made different decisions this fall based upon you know, health or their learning desires, that really um, challenged us in being able to exercise the type of flexibility we would want to take because staffing models were set. And so we did move some staff members around we found a lot of creativity with our teachers to find solutions that would best support students, albeit not the one singular teacher online. But in many cases, we were able to find that type of a solution um, in, in our schools. Um, and then where we weren't able to do that, uh, again, allowing our staffs to leverage flexibility or even partnering with other school communities to find ways that we would be able to support students um, one to two different teachers potentially 
Um, but that's something that we know we'll take into account as we build out that digital academy moving forward so that we don't have the same kind of challenges that we had this year. Thank you. David? Yeah, the, boy, the only thing I would, I would add to that, Dr. Thomas, was, you know, in all of our conversations this summer of what, what model do we use for this? And are we going to carve out uh, an online component, not knowing how many students were going to would take it, that, that one of the things that, that we determined was a community value is that, that, that families wanted to still be connected to their school. And so that's why when we had said, okay, instead of carving out something new over here and you don't know what teacher you're going to get, you are still connected to your school so that as we were anticipating what has actually happened is that this accordion effect of going into some quarantines and then coming back is that there was a continuity of the school um, with, with those teachers. And so we identified that as a value because we knew that the model was going to be changing, the instructional model would be changing throughout the year as, as it has. And, and so Dr. Thomas, I think you spoke to it well about how that has actually played out with the schools. And I understand the wish that the, the parent that said they wish this would have happened. Yet as we were making those decisions, we thought, boy, we just need that attachment to a school because that's where people are loyal to, is to their school and their teachers. Thank you, David. And this next one rolls right into um, the the next question. And I think you've both addressed part of this, but Sherry, I'm going to nod to you um, to add anything to this one. I wish elementary schools were working together so that no teacher would have to do both remote and in person at the same time. Sure, I'm happy to take that one. And you know, honestly, we do understand that challenge. Um, it is an incredible challenge that our teachers are, are really rising to meet to teach in both the remote environment and the in-person environment. Um, and I'm glad that I have another opportunity to thank them for doing so um, in this forum this evening. And I do understand where this parent is coming from. Um, again, I, I would reiterate what's been mentioned about the desire to keep students at their neighborhood schools and honor the choices that parents and families have made about where their child is enrolled. Um, we did look at this opportunity over the, the summer to see, do we start to pair some of our elementary schools? Um, but again, in many cases, that would have meant changing the enrollment for a number of our students. And that was just not something that, that we wanted to do. And so instead, what we asked elementary schools to do was to work together collaboratively as a staff and determine based on their staffing, uh, the number of students that they have enrolling in remote education versus in-person education. Um, and certainly with the support of their uh, executive directors is needed to determine what sort of method works best at any given school. So what you may see at school A may be very different than school B because those needs and those staffing um, allocations are different. And we continue to work with schools uh, as we, we move through this time. We've had schools try a model, decide that it didn't work very well, and we've helped them to tweak that model. Um, it's definitely an exercise in flexibility. Thank you, Sherry. This next question was submitted by a parent and it particularly talks about Palmer, but I think it could be a district wide um, statement. And what it says is this, now that Palmer is switching to remote learning full time until next semester, is there a possibility that a new shorter schedule could be considered? Who would like to take? Yeah, I'll, I'll defer that to uh, Mr. Hoff uh, when it comes to schedules. You know, we really allow schools the flexibility in terms of what those master schedules need to look like. Um, and certainly, I think uh, at a change of semester or a natural break uh, of instruction is, is a time to look at that if we're going to do any deep structural changes because it impacts every student when you do that. Um, but Mr. Hoff, if you want to go ahead and take uh, the Palmer specific question, and perhaps pull it up to high schools in general. Thank you, and uh, I will speak to that part is, 
Boy, the uh, the scheduling process has been very extensive, collaborative, and looking for the best one that's going to serve all students as best possible at the high school level. Uh, so when I speak to Palmer, I'm also actually also speaking across all the high schools as they all have like schedules going forward right now. And we continue to monitor those schedules about what's working and what is not working. Um, but there's also a need to serve uh, the population across our schools with um, you know, families trying to meet the needs of having students at the school and looking for the best learning model going forward. And actually there is some strength in schools being on the same type of schedule or, or frame of that at the high school level. It meets a lot of needs for a lot of students. So I guess the short answer to that would be that we continue to monitor schedules to best put forth instructional practice and to support our community. Thank you, Dan. Next question is, can the schools that feed into one another have more closely aligned schedules? Not only the start and end of school more aligned, but also the days. Submitted by a parent. Dr. Thomas, would you like to start? I'm not completely sure what they might be asking in that question, because there's a couple of ways that you could go um, with how this is being asked. Um, so let me attempt, um, you know, to, to get to the core. Um, I certainly understand the parent's desire, and I'm making an assumption here that this parent might have kids in elementary, middle and high school, so pathway alignment in uh, scheduling, family friendly, friendly scheduling uh, with pathway schools um, might be one angle that this parent is asking. And, and, and uh, I would say that makes sense that schools that feed into one another have some alignment. Um, in terms of uh, schedules, that may or may not be the case. It's more, I would say, curricular alignment that we focus on uh, when we're talking about elementary schedules, middle school schedules, and high school schedules, um, we have varying uh, bell times and transportation and, and all those factors that are built in that, um, one, help uh, uh, support uh, the, the development and kind of needs of students, but also the efficiency uh, that we have to operate within um, as, a, as a district, you know, being public stewards of, of taxpayer resources. Uh, that's sometimes why we maybe have certain bus schedules. Um, so, so the start and end times, I know it wasn't a specific ask of this parent, um, but I wanted to make sure I put this into that space so that the community understands that's sometimes what drives, you know, those schools in that various pathway. Um, the days um, is where, where I might be getting a little bit thrown off because you know, we have days, you know, we have days that the district might be um, closed. Uh, it could be a district-wide PLC day, uh, you know, coming at the end of the quarter. Uh, staff are doing their grades, et cetera, and that kind of a thing. Um, but I might want to turn to the any of the EDSLs if you are reading maybe into the day component that this parent might be asking because that one is pretty consistent across the board um, with our district-wide calendar of days in session and days out of session. Dr. Thomas, the, the one piece that comes to mind is that our elementary schools do um, finish their school year three days earlier than our middle schools and our high schools. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that's what this parent might be referring to. Um, and that has to do with the way it's a little bit of a, a complex issue, but the way that meeting schedules, planning times, those sorts of things are different at the elementary level than at the middle and high school level. Um, but might also be an opportunity for us to look at maybe some opportunities to use those three days in a way that could benefit parents and still get elementary schools what they need. Right. Yeah, and, and I would also, and that could be uh, what's in here, um, Ms. Pierce, in this question, but I would also say there, there are different requirements even at the state level for contact time um, that's different for elementary and different for secondary. And so that's also some of the pieces that drive some of the district calendars in, of days compared to, you know, uh, levels of, of you know, middle or, uh, I'm sorry, elementary compared to secondary. 
Great, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Next question, what support do parents and students need during COVID and distance learning? And this is from a staff member. So I'm gonna open that up to everyone. What support do you think parents and students need during COVID and distance learning? So I'll just start real quickly and then allow others to weigh in on this because this is something that's very important to us as well. Going back to that community engagement aspect, um, our, our families are our students first and foremost teachers. And no matter what we do during the school day, it's either reinforced at home um, or it's not. And, and that's something that we need to have that partnership. Um, literally just today, we, we were having a conversation as executive cabinet and EDS, all the people that you see here on, on this WebEx, um, about issuing um, a, a survey to our community um, as a mid-year checkpoint to ask this very question to our families um, in very specific ways. So I, I want our community to make sure that around mid-December we'll be uh, opening up that survey, um, and, and it should, similar to what we did earlier, it would be phone-based um, as well as online-based um, so that they can participate in telling us what supports that they might need moving forward on the second half of the year. But to that staff member, we are going to be polling our community so that we have real specific understanding of what we need to do differently and or what do we need to continue to do because it's working really well. Great. Thank you for that. Does someone else want to push in? Okay. Next question. What is being done to help with the workload of elementary school teachers who are teaching in person and online? And we touched on that briefly earlier. Does anyone have anything to add to that? At the time that this question was probably submitted, we had yet to communicate to our, our families and our staff um, the decision to uh, adjust our elementary schedule to align with our middle school schedule so that our elementary staff do get that day of asynchronous instruction with students as well as their ability for PLC and professional development time. Um, I just want to say thank you to our elementary staff who started the year five full days a week. That was an ask that I had to make sure that our youngest of students um, had five day of instruction and supervision um, because it's more challenging, you know, for families when it comes to younger students and, you know, what will families need to juggle to ensure that they have supervision on those asynchronous days. But what this kind of ties back to the other question um, asked by a staff member earlier this evening about, you know, why do we prioritize the needs of students over that of staff? And I just, you know, again, how we address them might look differently, but needs are always equally prioritized. And so here's a clear example. Staff's needs um, uh, needed to be addressed, particularly at the elementary level, because the load was so intense um, that many of them are running a marathon at a sprint pace and it would be a matter of time before our staff would crash and burn at the elementary. And so to make sure that they're supported and that they are able to be taken care of, we adjusted that elementary schedule um, and that will go into effect um, starting November 30th, uh, where we'll have a day of asynchronous instruction on Mondays and then Tuesday through Friday will be synchronous instruction very similar to the middle school model. Actually, it's exactly the same as the middle school model. Great. Thank you for that. Sherry, did you want to add anything to that? Just a, Just a quick addition, um, and it's really a, a shout out to our curriculum and instruction department, who has been working really since last summer to put together ongoing and on-demand professional development um, for all three levels of teachers. Um, and so elementary teachers certainly will benefit from that as well, have been benefiting from that as well. And we'll have additional time on Mondays to access those opportunities too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, David Engstrom, I'm coming to you. 
with the next question. After the pandemic, will there be an option for the student to study online or in person? Um, I, I wish you would tell me that this pandemic would end tomorrow so that I <laughs> and starting tomorrow, it will be, um, yes. And, and uh, we, we can't, we, we can't, it can't come soon enough for us. And, and yet we also know we're going to be a changed district after the pandemic. And, and we have not quite defined who we are going to be after the pandemic. We're developing an academic master plan. And um, maybe this is my chance to, to plug our next round of community engagement um, that on December the 7th and December the 8th, uh, we are going to hold a series of community input meetings about the academic master plan and our facilities master plan. And, and stay tuned, you're going to see that we're going to host eight meetings a day on Monday and Tuesday of the 7th and 8th of December, uh, 90 minute sessions to be able to get input about what the, as we're, as we're rebuilding District 11, both, both literally through the facilities master plan and academically. And yet we know, um, Patty, as this question, um, I don't know if it came from a staff member or, or a parent, but as, as, we, as we know that we are going to have um, a traditional uh, online school that is going to be available next year. And so there are going to be options for students. We haven't determined the grade levels, if it'll be K-12, if it'll start K-5, but we know that there's going to be a new school for students who are who are choosing to say, this is how I want to continue to learn. Okay? And, and of course, we want to go back to normal of, of in-person instruction. And so it's going to be that question of when can we do that? We know our, our new school will start um, for sure this coming fall. The Board of Education has already supported it, and we have hired a principal for that school. Um, and yet, how will we have changed is, is going to be really interesting through this because this, especially the model at the high school and the middle schools of a hybrid AB schedule and students who are being to, able to remote in and how the, how the, um, the, those um, academically intense courses at middle school and high school are delivered you know, will there be options of students to still be a Coronado student and to still learn from home because the capacity of our teachers have grown so much that they say, I now know how to handle that. I can have 25 students here in front of me and five remoting in because I did it all last year. That remains to be seen if we'll be doing hybrid models such as that, but, but for sure, and we cannot wait to have uh, all in-person instruction but we will be having um, online, more online options available to our community uh, next fall. Great news. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. We're on question 16 and it's a comment. Thank you to all the hardworking teachers and administration. As a parent, I really appreciate all the support for my children. Somebody quickly in one minute or less. Anybody want to take it? Dan? Yeah, I think there's another opportunity to say what we've witnessed over the last eight months is absolutely inspiring from what we've seen as the instructional staff. Um, absolutely amazed at the processes they put forward and all of the learning that's continuing and all of the uh, all of the things that are going to come forward from this. So if you hear nothing else here, this it's been an absolute honor to see what's going on in our buildings and our teaching staff moving forward to serve our community and our students every single day. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, this one is going to the Davids. What's the district wide attendance and grading plan for the pandemic? How is this being communicated district wide? This is from a parent. Quick, uh, I'll jump in before David Colicky does. Okay. Um. <laughs> Uh, I, I think David can take the backside of this, but I'd like to start um, by sharing is and when I hear this question and it's about grading and attendance, it, it really is about um, engagement and learning. 
because during this pandemic and whatever instructional model that uh, a student in the community is being served by in person, hybrid or, or remote learning, um, well, Dan Hoff just said, we have been inspired by, by how our staff has just grown and developed. And yet it has been challenging because we have asked our staff to do a lot. And we've asked them to do a lot. And here's some, some specifics with that. Um, not only have we um, introduced one-to-one -one technology with all of our students and have staff being trained on how to use that technology, we also have introduced um, a, a learning management system called Schoology. There were about 15 of our schools that were using it before the pandemic. All of our schools are using it right now. So between the pools of technology and the platform of which we can hang our curriculum and, and, and instructional strategies in, what, what has happened is that um, We've been asking our teachers to learn a lot of new tools and a lot of new ways to deliver instruction. And that while we don't have, or engagement, we don't have a district-wide grading practice, we're providing through our curriculum and instruction department, we're providing um, what we call asynchronous professional development of that what teachers can access to learn more but they can do it by watching videos created by the district. They can go to resources that have been created by the district. So that um, while our, 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 our research has shown is that our students are not as engaged and our grades are, um, grades of many of our students, especially at the high school level, are suffering. And so we are providing resources for our teachers about how to look at assessment differently instead of it being a traditional way of assessing their students, could it be performance-based? Could it be project-based? Multiple measures that they could use in order to say, is this student learning as they're watching the student on a little screen and trying to interact with them? And so, um, so we're providing the resources for our teachers through curriculum and instruction, uh, through the Monday planning days and professional development days, we're developing a, um, a plan for how we're going to deliver even more professional development opportunities so that our teachers can, can think even differently in this new environment about how do they grade their students um, that, 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 are, that are authentic um, and engaging. Um, and then when it comes to, to attendance, um, you know, I'd like to kick that one over to, to David Colicky because we have, uh, um, by uh, uh, statute, how we have to do attendance. We've tried some different ways of doing attendance through the through the Schoology platform, but it's different at each of the levels of how attendance is taken. And so, so David, could you could you speak to that part of it, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, in addition to assessment, my office oversees enrollment, and that means um, engaging with Colorado Department of Education on how to monitor what are called contact days. So those are days that we that we uh, mark as schools as students being in attendance at their school. Um, those are generally pretty pretty tightly defined. Um, CDE, the Department of Education, um, has opened up some of the other options for being able to take attendance and to mark students as uh, as uh, present and count count them as a as a contact day. So what um, what CDE mandated from us is uh, that we create what's called an equivalency statement in which every, each level, a working team from each level, level being elementary, middle, and high school, um, establish the norms and the expectations across their level, across elementary, say, or across middle school, for how uh, what, what engagement in the educational process will look like um interaction so what did an asynchronous instructional day look like and uh, compared to a synchronous uh, synchronous being face-to-face -face live uh, asynchronous being here's some work that needs to be done go out and do it and then how we can how can we measure attendance pretty much across all, all three levels uh, attendance can be measured in a multi in a, in a variety of ways so uh schoology login so we can see each other face to face and i can take attendance that way i think that's probably the most common um, um, or so I'm sorry, WebEx or Teams uh, face to face. Schoology login and submitting of work. 
um, submitting of paper-based work, uh, email, a direct email uh, between student and teacher, um, and any other kind of just individual individual contact or individual communication, such as phone call and such. So the, obviously, the big challenge, and I saw another question around um, some of the some of the challenges around technology. We want to we want to build a system that is flexible enough to absorb those challenges. So if, if a router goes down or if internet internet service is interrupted, there, there are still ways to be counted um, counted present while still maintaining an expectation of rigor and accountability to, to CDE. Um, so that's that's been the challenge. We've been working through the EDSLs primarily to just monitor that and especially where it gets challenging right now is in school that goes back that's been going back and forth from quarantine status one class might be quarantined while the school is operational an entire school might be quarantined or an entire school might be up and running that's where the challenge of maintaining uh maintaining those those metrics um really emerge and so we've been working with the with the edsls who've been working with principals and it's been a a um a very robust and healthy partnership that's i i just want edsls are very quick to uh point out um the inspiring work that they see with teachers and principals and i want to just give them a shout out because they've spent a lot of time and a lot of their day is spent in details like this which keep the district running so thank you so much for that and that partnership but it's a it's a pretty well defined uh strategy now it's allowing that definition to transcend and move across all the different permutations of how education is happening in D11. Thank you very much to both of you. I'm going to be able to ask one more question and we're only going to be um, able to give it about three and a half minutes and I'm directing it towards the EDSLs. Why hasn't my kids principal communicated with us this whole year? District 20 principals email out weekly in addition to the teachers. This was from a parent. I'm happy to start this one. Um, first of all, I, I do hope that this parent is watching this evening because I am sorry that you're not receiving communications from your child's school. Um, so many of our schools are communicating on a weekly, if not daily basis with parents um, about schedules and changes in learning and expectations of students in remote learning and all sorts of topics that are really relevant right now. We do use a system called the loop for our communications uh, that are sent home to parents, both from the district and the school level. And sometimes what we find is that this is a manner or a matter of setting up the correct preferences in the loop. Um, which we are more than happy to ha help any parent to do. Um, there are many folks, both at the central office level and at schools, that can help you to set those up. Um, that being said, this is a little bit challenging to answer because we don't know the school that this is coming from or specific details. So if the parent who submitted this is watching this evening, I would encourage you tomorrow, give us a call at 520-2000 and we will help you track this down and figure out how to get those communications to you to make sure that they are reaching um, you in a way that works for you. Thank you, Sherry. Dan, anything you wanted to, to add to that? I, I think Sherry pretty much nailed it. I would just say we, we always welcome the comments and we would love to hear from you and let's get this solved because we got to make sure that we are communicating with our parents, students and families. Absolutely. Right. Well, everyone, we've addressed as many questions as our time permits, but I'd like to conclude this evening by getting some final thoughts from our panelists. So as we wrap up, let's get you to, to um, share with us some of your thoughts about this evening. Who wants to go first? Okay, Jim, Director Mason, please. I would like to just say to everyone, parents, community members who may not have uh, students, children, students in our schools, to the staff and to some students, because hopefully some students are listening in. This entire last seven, eight months 
has been, uh, this challenge has been a work in progress. I think we all can agree we have seen some very high points. We've seen some points that uh, were revealing and we did not expect. And we have discovered some shortcomings. I think to make this an enduring learning experience, because there are some real lessons here that we will be using from this day forward. We have to work together as a holistic team. And I that's what I would ask. I would ask that each of us look within ourselves and always take a very professional, positive approach to the challenge. And let's lean on each other. Uh, we have a saying in the Army, and that simply is this. Everyone is a safety officer, and you never walk by a mistake. And we're all professionals who want and desire coaching and mentoring. Those are the three basic principles that we lived by as military folks. And I think they're applicable and very applicable uh, to today. Because at the end of the day, every successful task is accomplished through teamwork. And each and every one of us have a part on the team. I'm very proud of what I see from our staff, what I see from our students, what I see from our parents, and what I see from our community in general. I couldn't be prouder because we are pulling together and we are helping each other. I would just only ask in closing, let's not forget that. And let's hang together and let's do this together and let's encourage each other. Part of that encouragement is when you see Mason not fully performing to standard, let me know. It's not purposely. It is because I'm tired or I don't know. When you see Mason doing something right, let me know. Because I probably don't recognize it. But that piece of encouragement is what allows me to be and to meet my full potential. And I use myself as a reflection for each and every one of us. We're doing very, very well in a very difficult situation. There will be another challenge as soon as we get through this one that will be equally daunting. The, the principles and the things we're learning here will be carried forward into the future. And I would like to just close with a very sincere thank you to each and every one of you that make up this District 11 team because it is a first class team and we will be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mason. Who would like to go next? I'll go next. Please. Um, I just want to say that we know that COVID has exacerbated the inequities in our society and our schools are trying to struggle with how we fix that. I am super pleased with the way that our district has leaned into equity and has used that as its kind of north northern star and its guiding like through line. Um, and as we use that as our, our through line and what's going to guide us in our work, I believe that we are going to be successful in educating all of our students because we are looking at those who are the most underserved and the most vulnerable amongst us and deciding how we can support them and then lift everybody else up. And so I think it's an exciting time for District 11 with our equity policy and the work that we're doing around equity. And I think as we lean into that, any challenge that we face um, is going to, we'll be, we'll be able to solve it. I think we have the right folks in the room. Thank you, Alexis. Someone else? I'll go next. Oh, okay. Um, so I just want to just want to reiterate, just at, at every level, the dedication, the dedication and the passion that I've I've seen. I'm, I'm relatively new to the district. I came uh, last summer. Great year to start. And actually, I mean that. It's uh, been it's 
it's been a, a wonderful experience and just um the the passion that everyone brings to uh quality education and high standards has been has been wonderful and uh situations like these and pressures like these reveal that passion and how we come at it from different ways with at different angles with different conversations but it's there nonetheless and just the ability to assume positive intent in decision making um and sometimes those decisions are very very have, have to be made very rapidly I just want to uh, reiterate and give my uh, give my appreciation to my colleagues directly here, but also uh, everyone out in the buildings and the staff um, at all levels. Um, I do think that this is also an opportunity from my from my vantage point in both assessment and enrollment. Um, our two number one priorities as a, as a school district is uh, preparing our students academically for the, for whatever next phase they want to enter after they are done with D11. And um, we have to keep that as our right in our forefront with that lens of equity, but that's what we're on the hook to do. And as a district, we want to engage with families at a deep level and uh, keep them engaged in, and uh, connected to the D11, D11 community. So uh, for this, for the sake of enrollment and and uh, and improving that, and I think this is an opportunity to do that. And like I said in my previous comments, um, we can't depend on the state to give the, give us those that guidance at this point. Right? We have to make those decisions ourselves and be proactive, have an external locus of control in those approaches. And I see I see everybody at each level stepping up to do that, and it's been a wonderful uh, team effort. And I think it will really um, inform our work for accountability um, significantly moving forward after this time ends. Thank you, David. Phoebe, I'm going to go to you for one minute and then we'll, we'll end with Dr. Thomas. Thank you, Patty. Um, uh oh, my video. But anyway, I just want to take the opportunity to take the to say to the staff, thank you for um, being resilient and coming uh, together and working toward difficult times because this is this is a difficult time for everyone. But um, in my division, personnel support services, we are here to provide the best quality service that we can provide in this particular time and. Always remember, we are doing what is in the best interest of our students, our staff, our community, and the district as a whole. We appreciate it. Thank you, Phoebe. Dr. Thomas, and then I'll wrap when you're done. Sounds good. Um, thank you again, community, uh, for dialing into this. And thank you to the panel that you uh, have seen here tonight and to um, the thousands of staff uh, that we have all throughout uh, D District 11. You know, I joined the D11 family three years ago and it's been the best choice I could have ever made. Um, you know, a couple of months ago, Education Week published a, a blog saying, the worst job in education is that of the superintendent right now, right? Um, I'll, I'll tell you, I wouldn't trade anything these past seven months uh, has given me. I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't want to do it again, but I wouldn't trade it. Um, it has taught me a lot about who I am as a person um, and who I am as a professional and has really forced me to grow in ways I might have never otherwise grown. And I'll just close with one of my favorite quotes that I use a lot. And I think these times uh, this quote is uh, uh, very appropriate. And it's by Booker T. Washington in East States. I have learned that success in life is not to be measured by what one has attained, rather by the obstacles one has overcome while trying to succeed. And I think COVID has been one of the greatest obstacles that has ever hit any of us. Um, and we are doing everything and anything in our powers to overcome that obstacle. So by that definition alone, we're already successful. But as we emerge on the other side and really move into a post-COVID organizational mindset in a way of being. Um, I'm just thrilled to know that we have such amazing staff all throughout the district and such strong partnerships with our students and our families and our broader community 
that as a result of COVID, we will emerge a fundamentally different and improved and stronger District 11. So thank you again, community, for dialing in. And thank you, Ms. Pierce, for uh, being a facilitator and host of our first session this evening. Dr. Thomas, it was my pleasure and my honor. Thank you to all the panelists tonight and especially to our viewers. Although community engagement looks different, especially this year, we know how important it still is. There will be four more of these Beyond the Mask events happening every month through March. We invite you to submit your questions for the December 15th event or any of the following events that will come in the future. You can do so by visiting www.d11.org forward slash beyond the mask. Please stay healthy and well, and we wish you and yours a relaxing Thanksgiving holiday. Good night.